So good morning. Thank you all for joining us this Sunday morning. It's not exactly um, a time that I think most people are used to being up and listening to lectures about diseases. If anything, you're in church and singing lovely songs instead. But I don't have a Parvo song for you this morning. So <laughs> we'll have to do something different. Um, quick question. How many of you were at the Parvo lecture that I gave probably three years ago at this conference? Do I have a couple people? OK, good. You're going to hear some repetition. I don't have that many of you, so that's good. I plan that there'd probably be not that many. But you'll hear some rep repetition, and you'll also hear some new information, because things have changed since I gave that lecture a few years ago, even. So um, first thing I want to do is just kind of take a straw poll. What is your organization's current approach to a dog with parvovirus in your shelter? Do you transfer to a private practice for treatment, treat in the shelter, treat in foster care, euthanize, or other? So how many transfer to private practice for treatment? How many treat in the shelter? A couple. Treat in foster care? Fewer, but a handful. Euthanize at times, and you may do some of both. Good. And then another approach? Do I have anything that didn't fit those boxes? OK. Good. Well, that's helpful. We do have kind of a distribution um, across, although certainly it looks like treating in the shelter and private practice seem to be the most common. And I will have some information later on a survey that kind of supports that, that that's true nationally, too. What about that puppy's healthy litter mate? So let's say you have a puppy that's diagnosed with parvo, but you've got a bunch of healthy litter mates. Quarantine and monitor that puppy in the shelter? OK. Quarantine and monitor off-site somewhere? OK. Perform a diagnostic test on that other puppy? A couple hands. So I have a feeling there may be some that are already doing some of the things I'll talk about today. Euthanize a healthy puppy. And I realize I put you in a difficult position you may not want to raise, but I did want to put that on there. And then other, something different? Oh, wow. Good. I captured them all. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tests that are out there, some of the strategies, um, a little bit of a review on parvovirus, although most of you probably know everything I'll say there, uh, a little bit on outbreak management. A show of hands of who was in the outbreak management discussion yesterday in the vet track. Do I have a couple? I know Lily was there with me, just one. Two. OK, good. Um, a little bit about the Colorado State Outpatient Protocol. How many have heard of that? Just a handful. OK, good. And then a, little, a few words on case selection and animal welfare, um, which tends to be something that I always come back to in talking about any disease in shelter medicine, is also that even though you may have protocols and the way your organization approaches it as a standard, there's always the element of the patient that we have to look at and really think about, is this a, the patient that I should really select to treat? Um, is it humane to treat this patient today, given their circumstances? So I'll, I'll kind of end with that. So of course, I have to start with a puppy picture and give you Parvovirus Annie. Um, so she's going to kind of follow us through the lecture today. So Parvovirus Annie is transported with three other puppies from Tennessee. And I love Tennessee. I don't mean to pick on them. Um, but it is a place where actually I've been actively involved in transporting puppies from. So I chose there. She's 10 weeks old. Um, she was vaccinated three days prior to transport with a modified live vaccination for DHPP and normal when she arrived at the shelter. However, on day one, she stops eating. And on day two, she vomits. And on day three, she gets diarrhea. Okay, So we're going to kind of keep her in the back of our mind as we work through a problem. I kind of did that on purpose. I always like to remind people that the diarrhea and the vomiting doesn't necessarily come first. Your first warning sign is usually that puppy that doesn't eat. And if you can be really watching the puppies for that, that makes a huge difference in catching them early. So basics of parvovirus. Clinical signs we all know, vomiting and diarrhea. But lethargy, anorexia, fever, and nonspecific signs will usually come first. So as soon as I have puppies under the shelter, somebody is monitoring their appetite and how they're eating. Um, and then a fever will often precede, not always, but often precede the other more obvious signs of vomiting and diarrhea. Leukopenia, so low white cell count. And that's obviously something you'd find on a diagnostic test. And sudden death, particular to puppies. Um, and that is because they can have parvovirus that infects their heart cells. And so parvovirus targets rapidly dividing cells. The heart is one of those organisms that's rapidly dividing and growing. And we will see puppies develop myocarditis and actually die in the, at early ages. And so that sudden death puppy, even if it didn't have vomiting and diarrhea, is still a, still a suspect for parvovirus. Um, in the environment, parvovirus, just to remind you, is a non-envelope virus. It's a DNA virus. It's very tough to kill. So it's like I always think of non-envelope viruses like little pieces of metal in your environment. And they are tough to kill. 
tough to get rid of. Um, and so that is one of the reasons that it is such the bane of, um, of shelters and rescue groups, because if you do get it in the environment, if you miss it early, and it contaminates your environment, you can find yourself in trouble. And preventive care. It is an antigenically stable DNA virus, and so our vaccinations are very reliable and protective. An animal that is vaccinated past the period of maternal antibodies, so past the age of four months, is generally protected and may be protected for years or even life on the basis of even a single vaccine. Um, obviously, we give repeated vaccines, booster vaccines, to kind of be sure we're protecting them, but it is a very stable DNA virus, and that is why our vaccines are so effective. So, a little immunology to take you back to tech school or or uh, college, or yesterday I had a high school student in my um, problem-solving tabletop. There was a high school student who had just studied salmonella, and our topic was salmonella, and she knew more about salmonella than I did. She rattled off all this molecular information, and I was like, wow. Um, I'm gonna call you when I have my next salmonella outbreak. But to take you back to a little immunology, not to make you crazy, it's one slide. What's really good um, about parvovirus is that the vaccines are extremely effective, like I just said. If you are using a modified live box vaccination, and every one of you should be using modified live vaccinations, they promote immune, protective immunity in a short time frame, as rapidly as three to five days, um, and they should absolutely be used in shelters. So if you're not sure, you need to go back and look at your package of vaccines. Are they modified live vaccines? And they should be. The bad. The prevalence of protective antibodies um, entering shelters can vary. So in private practice, animals that walk into private practice, they tend to have antibodies, either through previous vaccination or through natural exposure to a low dose in the environment that may not have made them sick. But we know that that differs in shelters, and I'm gonna give you the numbers on that in a, coming, in a slide that's coming up. And then the ugly, in young animals less than 16 weeks, Maternal antibodies, so the ones that they get from their mothers, can interfere with the vaccination. And so then these vaccination, these animals are obviously the ones that are most susceptible. So people often ask me, what age do I need to give the vaccines and how many do I need to give before they're protected? And my answer is, it doesn't really, the number of how many you give is not the, the focus. What needs to be the focus is what age are those puppies. You need to give them serially until they are over 16 weeks of age, because that's when the maternal antibodies are waning. So just like I said, um, with Modified Live, it is effective. It's effective within days. Um, and if there are no maternal antibodies present in a challenge study, meaning where they introduce parvo to unvaccinated, to um, un pathogen free puppies, um, 98 to 99% of those dogs developed Im immunity to one dose. And that can even be in a young puppy, because if they don't have maternal antibodies from their mother, they are actually kind of set up to start responding to that vaccine earlier. It can vary based on their ability to respond, their own kind of genetic immunity that they've inherited. But if there are no maternal antibodies in play, they actually develop immunity earlier to those vaccines. And so that's why in practice, we often talk about only giving distemper vaccines now every three years, because they really do promote, promote a long-term immunity. We don't talk about that in shelters necessarily. Our animals are at higher risk um, of exposure. And even in some communities, I don't talk about that. I work in communities in the Dakotas um, where parvovirus is very high risk. And certainly there are communities in the South where parvovirus is very high risk. There are communities in certain parts of Syracuse City where we do wellness clinics that I would still recommend yearly vaccine um, because the risk of exposure is so high. Shelter animals do not have equal protection. They generally don't. So if you're looking at um, the prevalence, and PAT is for protective antibody, in a study of 1,441 owned dogs walking into veterinary hospitals, 95% of those owned animals, those owned dogs, had protective antibodies to parvo. So they were protected and would not get the disease even if they were exposed. A Florida study, 431 dogs walking into a shelter, 57%, only 57% had protective antibodies to parvo. So you can't assume that that animal walking into the shelter has protection even if it is an adult animal. Now generally, and this is anecdotal, if they have been altered already, if they've been spayed or neutered, I think 
they probably had a parvo vaccine at some point, and that we know that that's true. They've actually done tests looking at that. An altered animal is more likely to be protected. An unaltered animal, you have no idea. It's almost 50%, 57% of them are protected and 43% aren't. So much higher risk for those animals walking into our shelter without a history. And I just discussed a little bit about maternal antibodies. How many of you have seen this? You've had this little discussion on maternal antibodies. Most people are nodding. So a puppy inherits antibodies from their mother. Those antibodies will provide some protection against diseases, including parvo, in those first few weeks. But the antibodies decline over that time between zero, day zero, and 16 weeks of age. So they are declining. Meanwhile, you vaccinate the puppy, and it tries to build its own antibodies. And the maternal antibodies kind of knock it down a couple of times. And so you've got this window in between, this window of susceptibility, that box, that horrible black box, where the puppy is not protected by maternal antibodies and not protected by the vaccination. That's the window where they tend to get parvo. And for those puppies that did come in with maternal antibodies, that window is that 9, 10 to 12 week of age usually, is right where it sits. And so I get shelters who call and say, you know, we brought in puppies, they were 11 weeks old, they had two distemper parvo shots, why do they now have parvo? And the reason they have it is because they had maternal antibodies that worked against those vaccinations and they are in that critical window when they're most susceptible, that 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 weeks. Yes? So maternal antibodies are coming from the mother being vaccinated. Yes. If the mother's not vaccinated, they are at risk of getting parvo if they are exposed it pretty instantly. Yes, instantly. However, they are also better able to mount their own immune, immune response to the vaccine you give them. And so it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, right? We still recommend vaccinating mothers and, and um, providing that protection, but you do kind of set them up that they're not going to respond as easily to your vaccine. All right, so what does this mean for Annie? Cute little Annie that you just want to like pick up and snuggle. Um, well, let's see, she came in and she was vaccinated three days before and then developed these signs. So we know the incubation period, and incubation period is defined as the time of exposure to the time of signs is about two days to 14 days. So do we think she was exposed in our shelter or do we think she was exposed where she came from? probably where she came from. So if we trace it back, she was probably exposed prior. Could she have been exposed prior to her vaccination? Possible, incubation period as long as 14 days. Um, she might have been exposed at the time or even on the transport. Some of these puppies will break really quickly. Some of them will take a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, she could have been exposed at any point in that window. So incubation period, time of exposure to time of signs. Shedding period. They can shed up to two days before they show you any signs. Now, it also depends what you're defining as a sign. So I told you vomiting and diarrhea, that's generally when people's alarm bells go off. But that not eating is an early sign, and that's why it's so important to watch, because they could be shedding, even at the point of just starting to feel pretty lousy and showing you, I'm not going to eat all of my breakfast this morning. I'm going to lay around a little bit. They could be shedding at that point. They can shed as long as 14 days after recovery. Um, in some cases, it'll be shorter. In some cases, it could be longer. But that tends to be kind of the number that we, that we stick to. And I'll talk a little bit about testing, because um, testing definitely plays a role in how you handle this for Annie. And there are challenges in diagnosing and testing. The signs are nonspecific. So are there other things that make puppies vomit and have diarrhea? Yeah, much nicer things. I much rather give a puppy roundworms than give them parvo, right? So as a veterinarian, I want to be optimistic and be like, oh, I'm sure it's just roundworms. Don't even worry about it. And I'll never forget the, I will not forget the first puppy I saw in practice. After I graduated, I went into an emergency 24-hour practice, saw a puppy for vomiting, otherwise bouncing around. And I was like, oh, it's probably just roundworms. We'll warm it. And I walked out of the back room, and my mentor, Tuskegee-trained uh, guy from Alabama, and he looks at me, he's like, don't be a fool. You need to test that puppy for parvo. I'm like, oh, it's just roundworms. He's like, test that puppy for parvo. Tested the puppy for parvo, it was positive for parvo, um, and it, we caught it early. Catching it early can make a huge difference in treatment, and I'm going to talk about treatment, but we caught it early and we were able to treat that puppy. But I'll never forget that, and now every poor student who has to deal with me, I'm like, vomiting, test for parvo in a puppy. Don't wait. Um, so the signs are nonspecific. Missing a diagnosis in the shelter has a really high cost. 
you miss that early diagnosis, you miss that anorexic puppy and you don't test it, you are now exposing other puppies. You're exposing your staff to kind of carry it around the shelter. You may be exposing other animals on transport. There is a huge cost to missing it. And then testing can be confounded by vaccination. I'm going to talk about the details of that. But vaccination can actually confuse your testing, too. Whoops. And affected animals can be shedding prior to showing signs, which I just told you. So we do have excellent tests. And um, for parvovirus, we have several ELISA point of care tests. They are antigen tests. So remember, your point of care test can be antigen or antibody. They are antigen tests. They look for viral particles in the feces. Generally, direct rectal swabs are more sensitive. So don't swab the poop. Actually do a rectal swab when you do these tests because they are more sensitive. You are more likely to collect antigen. There is a controversy around them. So the big question is, if I get a light positive, we vaccinated Annie three days ago or three days before she transported. Now we test her and we get a light positive. Does she really have parvo? Or is it because she was vaccinated? I described her to you. How many people think she has parvo? How many people are worried it could just be the vaccine? Yeah, it could just be the vaccine. Is she showing signs consistent with parvo? Are we concerned enough to treat her as if she has parvo? Yeah, I think so. And so then the controversy becomes, and the, and the emotional part of this becomes, what is our treatment? Do we treat parvo? Or is the cost of a positive parvo diagnosis euthanasia in our shelter? Then we start to hedge, right? Then we say, well, maybe it's just the vaccine. Maybe it's not really parvo. The point is, is that you have to treat Annie as if she has parvo, and you have to have a plan for that. Um, because we can't be sure it's the vaccine. Um, Ron Schultz's work, he's a researcher in Wisconsin, will say that no, you do not get positive, you do not get vaccine positive with the IDEX, te IDEX test. Other studies, Lori Larson actually works with Schultz um, at Wisconsin, and she says, yeah, yeah, sometimes you do. So there's still a little bit of an argument around it. Um, and I do think anecdotally and in the shelter circles, we talk about, yes, you can get um, a light positive in a puppy that's been recently vaccinated. We generally think about three to seven days, you may get a positive. So it's recovering antigen, vaccine antigen. Um, and so in my world, I treat them as if they have parvo, even if I'm hoping they don't and that, that it's a vaccine positive, okay? And for us, that means all sorts of things like quarantine, et cetera. Um, but certainly, if they have strong clinical signs of parvo, really sick, vomiting, diarrhea, lethargic, not just bouncing around, that's probably a parvo positive and you need to go with that. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the question is about vaccine reactions. So you're not talking about building immunity. You're talking about like anaphylaxis and that sort of thing. No, no. Just so one looks like she's got parvo symptoms and one doesn't. Okay. If they're together vaccinated the same day, yep. why wouldn't they both have a vaccine? Okay. So the question is, if I've got two puppies in a litter, they were vaccinated the same day, they're, maybe they're even, you know, they're siblings, one gets parvo, the other doesn't. Does anybody know why? And the answer is yes. Yep, and it's a light positive. So parvo is, there's a couple of things about parvo. One, dose-related disease. You get a big pile of parvo, you're probably more likely to get sick than if you get a little bit of parvo. We all laugh, you can't be a little bit pregnant, but you can get a little bit of parvo, all right? <laughs> so it's a dose-dependent disease. The other aspect is that every puppy, even in a litter, has a different immune response, just like you and your siblings do. You may have allergies and your sibling doesn't, okay? You may have drug reactions, your sibling doesn't. So each puppy, even if they're in, the, they're in the same litter, can have different responses to vaccination and different immune responses, okay? And then there's the environmental factor. There's always that puppy that's not quite as strong, right? That puppy is gonna be more likely. Again, dose-dependent, smaller puppy, you may see more severe disease in that puppy. So it's because they're different um, in terms of their ability to respond, and it may be that their exposure was different even if they've been together. The other aspect is, and most of them will share parasites and other, um, infections at the same time, but a more heavily parasitized puppy, more likely to get more sick. Good question. Testing is really only one piece of the puzzle. So um, Dr. Janesco talked yesterday a lot about test interpretation in the DVM track, because we like to think, I did a test, I got an answer. 
I got a positive, now I know what to do. But every test has elements of interpretation that are tricky. And so you have to remember to judge based on clinical signs as well, and not just the test result. When in doubt, if you get that, if you get that positive, even a light positive, you need to isolate that dog from the rest of the population, maybe even isolate the litter since they've been together. There is a way you can look at um, doing blood smears to confirm parvo. So remember, leukopenia, low white cell counts. Getting a CBC, if you can send it to a lab, that's great. Make a blood smear, look at the blood smear yourself. See whether you see white cells. If there's an absence of white cells, that's pretty much a confirmation, or it's at least another piece of evidence, along with your clinical signs and your test. So don't forget the value of that, because that can be really important when you're sitting there questioning for yourself. And do remember, the parvo antigen test is not a screening test. It is not meant to be used on healthy animals. Because you are going to be more likely to get false positives if you're just screening healthy animals with it. It's also not economical. And because their shedding can be unpredictable, it's probably not a good use of your resources. You can certainly use it in suspect cases, that's different, or exposed cases, and I'm going to talk about outbreak management, but I don't recommend using it on every puppy when they walk in your door. Physical exam, clinical signs, monitoring, those are going to be more economical and useful to you than just swabbing, doing rectal swabs every morning and making sure you don't get any positive parvo results, because undoubtedly you probably will get some vaccine positives and freak yourself out and spend a lot of money on tests. It is not a screening test. It is a diagnostic test for clinically ill animals. So here's Annie, and here's her positive parvo test. And now what are we going to do for poor Annie? She feels pretty good. She's not flat out, right? She's still kind of looking at you through the, through the screen. She's not eating very well, but she's like, eh, I feel OK. Well, what are we going to do? Being prepared means pre-existing protocols. So Lily was in my group yesterday with our outbreak discussion, and one of the big conclusions those groups came to boy, we should really have an outbreak plan before we have an outbreak. <laughs> we should know what we're going to do, because when, by the time you have the outbreak, it's too late. All right? And there's so many elements. It's not just about managing the disease. It's about managing the people and managing the PR and managing the money. Um, what are we going to do when it comes? And so being prepared means you already have talked about this over coffee and soda and beer and pizza. And you've already decided how you're going to handle it, what spaces you're going to use. Every outbreak's different. Your numbers may be different, but you've got to have some sort of backup. It's a disaster plan is what it is. And in many counties now, shelters are required to have disaster plans for if their building blows away or burns down or the power goes out. I say an outbreak, it's the same level of disaster. It might actually be worse because um, you don't necessarily get community response as quickly. Sometimes you actually get the community reacting negatively because you now have ill animals and they're looking to blame. Um, so it's much better to be ready. So what you need to do, you need to segregate your clinically ill animals immediately. You're going to need to invest in diagnostics. This is when you need your tests because that's how you're going to separate your animals in order to save as many as possible. You are going to strictly adhere to cleaning protocols all of the time, right? Nobody ever takes shortcuts in their cleaning protocols. But man, this is the time to really pull them out and make sure people remember how to do it. You're going to establish rational traffic patterns. Who's going in what building? Who's walking in what direction? Who's handling which animals? And you're basically going to have to segregate your staff to handle the different risk categories. You basically want people to go from the healthy animals to the vulnerable animals, the young animals to the old animals. And whenever possible, your clinically ill animals need their own staff. I know how hard that is. Sometimes for us, it's a matter of finding a volunteer staff that you specially train in managing that disease and that isolation center. But ideally, your clinically ill animals will have their own staff during that time period. You might have to consider shutting down intake or diverting intake to other shelters or another building. You, might ha you do want to consider opening your communication quickly to your volunteers. Now, as we discussed yesterday in those outbreak scenarios, how quickly do you want that message out there? You don't want people panicking. You don't want the news all showing up at your front door before you're ready. That's part of your plan. Who is your, the face of the organization that's going to be ready to talk to the media, to be ready to talk to your volunteers and your staff? Somebody's got to be identified as that point person. And that person, sh you should know who that is before you ever have an outbreak. You're going to want to enlist help 
the best way to get community support is to give them something to do as part of it. Even if it's, we need new litter boxes, we need cat litter, we need cages, get people, give them a job to help you and you'll get much better support because people want to feel like they're helping and a part of the solution. Uh, this is one of my personal things. I always think to myself, what's the worst thing that could happen and what's the best thing that could happen? And I prepare for both of those. And I really hope it's the best case, but I generally assume it's going to be the worst case because that's how I think. Um, but be prepared for that worst case scenario. What if all 40 of these puppies that just got off this transport now break with Parvo? What am I gonna do? And it's Christmas Eve. <clears throat> yes, I've been there. My, uh, it's a real scenario. Um, and I will tell you, I did have a plan. I still didn't quite have a plan that involved me taking care of 40 puppies on Christmas Day. Um, but indeed, that's what happened. So. Once you have, this is a little bit of outbreak management, so once you've identified, okay, we have Annie, Annie's positive, Annie has some litter mates, Annie came from Tennessee, who came with her, who's she been exposed to? We perform a risk assessment of our population. And so we decide who's low risk? Who's, and what might be an example of a low risk member of your population in this scenario? Yeah. Excellent, so surrender dog already neutered and al already altered probably protected, right? Super low risk. So that one's gonna go in the low risk category. Who's our high risk or the ones we can't be sure about? New Puppies, arrivals. yeah. New arrivals, absolutely are high risk and especially if they came with Annie on that bus. Good. Our immune animals? Probably the same as what you described as our low risk. They should be immune and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how if they're indeterminate, we might be able to determine if they're immune. So we may be able to move some animals into that category that we can't recognize just by looking at them. The not exposed, certainly low risk, okay? So the, anybody who's not exposed is pretty safe. Now remember, fomite exposure counts. So if you really kind of had wandering traffic patterns and people moving and going back and forth, uh, you may not have anybody who wasn't exposed. Your high indeterminate risk is gonna include your clinically recovered. How long does it shed? Right, we said 10 to 14 days, Could, can be longer, but generally, and so we know that our clinically recovered are probably not gonna be high risk if we wait out that period of time, but there's gonna be a window of time when they may have recovered and still be shedding. Potentially exposed that aren't showing clinical signs because they can shed how long before clinical signs? Two days, about two days, good. And then obviously our clinically affected are gonna be high risk. All right. So ways to kind of think this through. If they were not exposed, they're pretty much no risk or low risk. We're gonna segregate them, maybe even just get them to adoption. Let's keep them over there. We're gonna lock them down over an adoption, however that works, or lock off that space if you can do that. Some of you are probably gonna laugh because I know sometimes your shelters are one room. I've talked to you and I know and I've been there and I've seen it. But you're gonna to try to put your adoption center separate. Your immune animals, you can segregate and adopt. And I'm gonna give you some tips on how we can decide who is immune in this scenario. Clinically ill, we're gonna isolate them and treat them, we hope. Potentially exposed, we're gonna quarantine. What's the difference between isolation and quarantine? Anybody wanna give us a quick summary on that? Yes, ma'am. Isolating is they are sick and you know they are quarantining and keeping them separate too, but they haven't shown any signs yet. Excellent, so isolation is for sick animals. Quarantine is for potentially exposed animals that may not have shown signs yet. So we're watching them. So quarantine means that we're gonna put them somewhere and monitor them for signs, excellent. And then the clinically recovered, we wanna to move to adoption after their shedding period ends. So that's our plan. So now the trick is just figuring out how we put them into all these different risk groups. Signalment can help you, and I've already given you some hints on that. Adult fully vaccinated dogs, very low risk. All right, and we may just go with that. Other low risk, adults and puppies greater than four or five months of age that have a vaccine on board for at least one week. They're not no risk, but they're low risk. And there's some testing we can do to kind of make ourselves feel better about their status. Moderate risk, vaccinated puppies under four months of age. Those guys are really moderate to strong risk, I would argue. And then high risk, anything that's unvaccinated. Now. How many of you are vaccinated at intake when animals walk into your shelter or before intake? 
Yeah, sometimes in the truck. Sometimes, especially around here, I'll be honest with you, we don't actually have isolation for puppies at our local shelter. Um, and so what we've gone to now is if people even call us trying to surrender puppies, we try to convince them to hold on to those puppies for one more week. We go out to their house, we vaccinate them, and then we don't allow them to come in for seven days at least. So at least they have one vaccine on board out there in the community. And then they go into foster and they don't even hit the ground of our shelter until after several vaccines and they're ready for surgery and all of that. So all unvaccinated puppies and dogs are now gonna be at, at, at really high risk. And that can include your adult unvaccinated dogs. They are still at risk. We used to say to people, oh, if it's over a year or two, it's not parvo. But there, because the herd immunity has gone down with fewer vaccinations in the public, um, at times we've actually decreased the adult that are out there with protective antibodies that are kind of roaming and that's where that 57 percent comes from so our herd immunity in adult dogs that have not been vaccinated is not good um, and so those stray adult dogs that are coming in with no history of vaccine are risk high risk and then extreme risk obviously litter mates of the affected puppies so there is testing available that can help us decide who might be immune or how to put them in different risk categories. And this is called a protective antibody testing. Now, protective antibody testing has long been available at laboratories. So you could draw blood and send it to your diagnostic lab. Turnaround time on that? One week, good. So you would draw the blood, send it out. A week later, you would find out whether that puppy or that dog had antibodies against parvovirus. What's the problem with that? It's too long to wait, right? You've waited the week, it could have changed. If what you had was antibodies from mom, that may have changed. In that period of time, who knows what you've done? Like maybe they went into foster or maybe they've been sitting in your shelter. And so a week is too long. So a, a couple years ago, um, a point of care test came out. Is anybody using this? We've got a couple people in the audience using it? Okay, good. So there is, there's two companies, there's Symbiotics and there's Biogel Immune Comb. They're both these very complicated tests, and I'm gonna to talk to you about that. You've used them, yeah, they're a little bit rough to learn, but they are point of care. So you draw the blood on the dog, you run the test in real time, and it tells you right now at this moment in time, does this dog or puppy have protective antibodies against parvo? Are they protected right now? Um, as a side note, not a, you cannot use them for feline panleukopenia. So we do use the canine parvovirus antigen test, you cannot use this for panleukopenia. There's no ana good antibody test for panleuk at this point. So that's just an aside in parentheses because I'm not going to talk about cats otherwise, but I, people usually ask me that question. So here's the test. There, it comes in this little box with all, how many of you used to do the, or still do the heartworm tests in the wells? No? Everybody's doing the little Eliza's. I got a couple of hands. This is a well test, so it is labor intensive. Um, especially when you're first learning. It's about 20 to 30 minutes, you batch them. So you have these little wells um, that are lined and then you have to run like a control and um, a negative, a negative control, a positive control, and then your various tests. But you can do, you know, 30 puppies at a time or 30 dogs at a time if you have all the samples. Um, it's color metric reading and I'll show you some results. So you get different shades of blue depending on the level of antibody that you get. There is software that comes with it to aid in interpretation. And God bless Maddie's Institute, because there are two videos online that walk you through in real time, 20 minutes, how to run each of those tests. And if there's anything that I think has changed people's willingness to use these tests, it's those videos. So I strongly encourage you to watch those videos. Um, it runs about 10 to $14 per test, which is about the same cost as an antigen test for Parvo. But this allows you to actually then look at a dog and say, this dog is protected, it's no longer at risk, it was exposed on this transport, or it was exposed at this point in time, we're good, and we can move it along. Um, how good are these compared to the lab test? Because what we always worry about is, how good is this test, right? We want to make sure that it's actually going to work for us. A uh, study was done, 431 dogs on the day of admission to the shelter. Um, the samples were submitted to a diagnostic lab for a, for a IFA, and then they used the titer check and compared it. 98% specificity, actually better than the diagnostic lab test, the well test performed. Similar sensitivity to the IFA, low number of false negatives, lower number of false positives than the IFA. 
So you could actually trust your positive more than you could trust the diagnostic lab. Now when I say that, I'm going to have the next slide because sometimes you need a lot. Oh, the other thing is it's 25% of the laboratory costs, but remember you need somebody to do this for 30 minutes of their time, minimum, is how long it's going to take. So for those of you with sensitivity and specificity, I'm just going to do this really quickly. Don't die. All right, hang in there. I won't even look over here. We're just going to look here. So if it is a highly sensitive test, which I just told you that it is, that means you get few false negatives. And that's always how I remember it. Sensitivity has an N, negative has an N, few false negatives. So that means that if you get a negative result, you can trust it. Okay? Specificity. If you have a high specificity, which I just told you that it did, you get few false positives. Specificity has a P, positive has a P. So if you get a positive, you can trust it. Now, the kicker with this test is most of the time when we're talking about tests, we're talking about testing for the disease. Here we have to interpret it almost in the reverse because we are testing for the antibodies. So when you're testing for a disease, a positive is bad. But when you're testing for antibody protection, a positive is good. So when it comes to antibody testing, positive is good. So with a high sensitivity, you minimize false negatives, meaning a negative test, if you get a negative test, the animal is at risk of contracting the disease. And if we're minimizing false negatives, we are minimizing the chance that we're going to have an animal that tests as though it doesn't have antibodies, but it does. So the risk there is if we test them and they're negative for protection, what are we going to do? We may vaccinate them. We may have to quarantine them longer, right? Um, it depends. If, most shelters I know don't euthanize for that negative antibody, but they do have to quarantine longer. And then you wait and see what happens, okay? So the cost of that false negative would be a longer quarantine period. But again, that's going to be a really low number with this test. With the, high, with the specificity being high, you minimize false positives. So if that puppy tests positive for antibodies, it's most likely protected. And so we can make decisions to move it along faster. Um, and that saves us time in the shelter, saves us quarantining for 14 days. Um, and there are ways to, to then save your um, organization time, money, and worry. Okay. So how should we use it? Most of the time we look at using this in an outbreak situation or a transfer situation. So one of the organizations um, that did the early work in this transported a lot of puppies into their shelter. And their standard had been to quarantine all puppies for 14 days. They had a limited quarantine ward. It was really labor intensive. Um, when they went to using this, they started changing their risk categories. They would tighter check all puppies coming into the shelter and then have different plans based on their antibody levels. And I'll, I kind of show you a little bit of that plan. There is something to recognize. In an adult animal that tests positive for antibodies, you're going to feel really good that they're protected. Because they're an adult animal, those are most likely vaccine-induced antibodies and they're strong. The hesitation when this test was first started to be used a couple years ago is that it, what if it's a puppy and that is a mixture of maternal antibodies and vaccine antibodies? So you're in that window and you've got both. And the worry was that the puppy that's got the mixture is not as well protected. Maybe those maternal antibodies as they're waning are not going to be as protective as that, those ones that they're making. In reality, when the shelter started doing this, they found that it didn't matter because the test tested for both. And they were like, well, how are we going to know if it's just maternal antibodies and they're not as good and maybe they won't be protected? The truth is, clinically speaking, they were protected. So the puppies that came up pos with a positive antibody titer were protected. They had a couple of light positives that were questionable, and so then they would always kind of shuffle those to the longer quarantine period. So you use it to separate even your puppies at risk into categories. Outbreak scenario, same thing. Who are your most at risk? What's the moment? Was it you're hoping that you're at that moment in time in an outbreak situation that you can actually kind of catch it early. You test those at-risk dogs and then you can segregate them based on risk. And if they're protected, you feel really good about it. 
there is one thing you want to do before you go moving them to the adoption floor or sending them out. And what is that? Yeah, bathe them. Why do we want to bathe them? Where does parvo live? In the feces. And then anywhere the feces goes, right? So pretty much everywhere, including on the dog. So the parvo will stay on the dog. So you always, always, always want to remember to bathe animals that have been exposed. Because it could be on their hair coats, their feet, um, and all of that. So bathing is never a bad idea. You don't need to bleach them. All right? You don't want to put quats on them because quats don't work anyway against parvo. Um, you do want to use some good old fashioned soap, water, mechanical removal down the drain. Not all over the floor of their kennel, down the drain. OK? Yeah? You could, yeah. Now, I'm a little worried because it's Annie's sister, right? I'd feel better if it was a different litter. Um, but yeah, you could shorten her quarantine period and then kind of move her along with a bath. Because remember, if she's not bathed or she has any repeat exposure, this tells me she has antibodies today. Doesn't necessarily tell me she's going to have the same level because she's a puppy in four days because her maternal antibodies could be going down. You see that? So we have to eliminate any future exposure to that. Bathe her and then separate her is exactly what I would do there. Okay. So is there a place for testing puppies? We just did all this. So this is Dr. Kate Kosminski at San Francisco SPCA. She was involved in some of the early clinical trials of this out in San Francisco. This is Ron Schultz who did a lot of the early work around this test and made the videos that are so helpful. Um, and they really looked at, because when you're bringing in 40 puppies a week into your shelter, the the difference between a seven-day quarantine, a 14-day quarantine, a 30-day quarantine is huge. And so this is how they applied it. Always having a plan in place for what about that breakthrough puppy. They're, you know, it's all risk. This is all risk. The only way to not take any risk is not to do anything and stay home and close the doors of your shelter, right? So there's always risk involved. And you will have the one that gets you. But you're going to be prepared for that. You're going to have the plan for that. So if they've got a high positive titer, they are more protected than another puppy with a low titer. We're going to quarantine them for a shorter period and remove them from the environment and bathe them. If they've got a low negative titer, that means they're not protected. Let's vaccinate them. And guess what? They're actually going to respond faster to that vaccine because they don't have maternal antibodies blocking it. So this is also giving us information that they're going to bounce. And we can test that antibody level in a week. We can use this test again to see how they're doing and are they building a response. Remember, there is a very small percentage of dogs that won't ever respond to a parvo vaccine. And that's where we get some of these stories of how, um, you know, like the black and tan dogs and Rottweilers and Dobies and those, like they're more prone to have parvo. Um, there were some genetic variations that actually, you know, there are some dogs that are non-responders and may never be protected. It's a really, really low percentage. Yeah, Lisa? Will we vaccinate if it's been less than two weeks since they were vaccinated? I will say we do sometimes. We do. Um, part of that is be, it depends. Were they vaccinated with me or were they vaccinated somewhere else? And were they vaccinated by a veteran tech or were they vaccinated by someone else? Right. So if I don't know the situation in which they were vaccinated, that is when I will tend to give them another one just so that I know I'm controlling that a little bit in terms of handling. Because remember, our modified live vaccines are really sensitive to temperature. Um, there are all sorts of ways that, you know, you can go awry in giving them. And paperwork is paperwork, especially if you're talking about animals moving between a shelter. So if I'm in question, I will vaccinate them shorter than two weeks. The second part of that question, mm -hmm. shelters like we have is very little isolation. Mm -hmm. Will you just go ahead, herd help, vaccinate everybody in the shelter if it's a small shelter and you're, you're, you have a big outbreak going on? So if we're having an outbreak, do we want to vaccinate everybody in the face of an outbreak? It would never be a bad idea. Yeah, it would never be a bad idea to vaccinate everybody. I mean, and, and again, your adult animals where you have a history of having vaccinated them and they're sitting in your shelter, their risk is so low. You could. I don't know that you need to. But it's also economically a little bit cheaper to go along and vaccinate everybody than it is to test. Yeah, the testing is really for your questionables. Because remember, signalment can play a huge role in how you define your, your risk categories. Okay, Good questions. So interpreting the titers, I think I already kind of went through this. The weak antibody titer is the most dangerous window, and it's both maternal antibodies, unclear protection. Yeah. 
And so this is, I gave you a little bit of a plan, so I don't necessarily need to go through this, but this was kind of, this is kind of an algorithm for how you can approach this problem. Positive, bathe and move along to adopt, if for protective antibodies. Negative, confirm vaccination, revaccinate, quarantine. Um, I just wanted to make sure you kind of had that in your notes, so I don't need to go through all of that because we kind of talked about it. Yeah, Lily? In puppies, remember, if it's positive, it can be a mix of maternal antibodies and, va and antibodies that they are building. So there is a chance in those eight-week-old to 12-week-old, even up to 14-week-old puppies, that that antibody titer is going to go down before it goes up again. So you need to capture that moment in time, remove them from further exposure, bathe them. Okay? You could send them out maybe with sick. You could. I would put them in foster just to monitor for a few more days, but you need to get them out of any possible exposure. And then as long as they're okay, go ahead and move along. So back to Annie, here she is. She's still waiting for you to make a decision. <laughs> we wish we had the plan a little faster. And she's like, yo, what are we gonna do? So this was, a, I did a webinar for Maddie's on foster care in particular. And one of the things we talked about was kind of the conundrum for Parvo and foster care. So how many of you put Parvo in foster care? I had a couple of hands, a few. Yeah, it's always a question, right? Because if they're parvo positive, you're putting them into foster. It's a disease that's going to infect that environment. It's, there's going to be impossible for them to really control it um, in their environment. It's really tricky to treat. Those animals can get really sick. They're really special foster cases. So one of the things I did is I asked kind of nationally, I surveyed all the people that were on the webinar and asked them. 36%, and this was 118 organizations, 36% of them had a pay, paid staff veterinarian, and that's how um, fostered animals got their care. 64% of them were using private practice clinics in the community. Some of them were in mix, so this doesn't all add up to 100%. But there is that element that private practice vet clinics are an option for something like this. Foster care is an option, but I would caution you that you pretty much contaminate that household, and you might really, um, really challenge that foster provider, depending on who they are. Most of the time, that foster care provider becomes a staff member, veterinary technician, veterinarian in their bathtub. Um, and once in a while, you've got a foster who's like built out a room, right, just for this. They basically have their biohazard ward in their home, and we love them for that tremendously. But a, pride veter a private veterinary clinic is, is certainly um, a reasonable and probably a really good option if you can afford it. So I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on treating parvovirus, because traditionally, you guys know, it's fluids. You've got to manage fluid needs. They're dehydrated. So IV fluids, IV antibiotics, you know, food, nutritional support. Generally speaking, a parvo case that walks into Cornell's emergency hospital, they get an estimate for somewhere between $2,500 up to $5,000. Is that crazy, Dr. Boyd? Is that on, on track? Yeah. So it's generally somewhere in that realm, a few thousand. Um, in my high-end practice I was in in Baltimore, the, we gave similar estimates. We had an isolation ward, our parvo treatments, five days, hospitalization, IV fluids, et cetera, $2,500 to $3,500. Um, in my first emergency care MASH unit hospital, our estimate was like $800 <laughs> to $1,000. Our isolation ward was a closet, but it was still me doing the treatment, and boy, did I really bust my tush to save that puppy that I almost didn't parvo test. Um, and I did it for that amount of money, but that usually takes practitioners who are really kind of subsidizing care, because it costs more than that to treat parvo um, in a hospital where you're on IV fluids 24 hours a day with technicians administering multiple treatments, really kind of trying to nurse that critical puppy back to health. Colorado State did a study where they tried to look at what can we do with outpatient protocols with puppies that either go home to their owners, where they're less likely to kind of expose um, other animals in the community if they're in that house, um, or what can we do with shelters even as an outpatient protocol? So their outpatient protocol is no slacker protocol. It's still a good $500 to $1,000, but it did demonstrate an 80% survival rate on an outpatient basis without hospitalizing those animals in the hospital on IV fluids. The gold standard treatment of IV shows about a 90% survival rate with Parvo. So it's pretty darn close for something that's about a, anywhere from a fourth to a fifth the cost. Still a high level of care. So the animal still comes in. They get an initial electrolyte assessment. They get an IV fluid bolus to meet their dehydration needs. So that was part of their outpatient protocol, which sometimes people forget when they're talking about it. 
So there is an IV bolus of fluids to correct electrolytes. They get an injection of Convenia, so the long-acting antibiotic. And then they went home. They did come back daily because it was a study to get assessed by the veterinarian at the hospital. They got sub-Q fluids daily to twice daily. So there's your sub-Q fluid load. They got Serenia injectably daily. They would get electrolytes and glucose checks daily, ideally. Um, syringe feeding and glucose supplementation, plus or minus pain medication. So most people like to put that in because parvo is painful. 20% of them needed buprenorphine. 20% of them needed ondansetron, so antiemetics. And some of them needed potassium supplementation. So this is still a pretty intense protocol. This is not just give the puppy some sub-Q fluids and try to get it eating, right? So it's still some pretty heavy nursing care, but it did demonstrate that they didn't necessarily have to be on IV fluids. Now this is where I caution you that I do think some of this is about patient selection. Remember, that test result, we don't treat the test result. The test result is in the face of patient signalment, who are good candidates for outpatient treatment, who are good candidates to do less than the gold standard if we're gonna be treating them humanely. But I do think their results are interesting, and a lot of different organizations are now looking at this and trying to come up with, this is part of their protocol, figuring out what can we do as outpatients. I will also say there absolutely has to be a veterinarian involved in writing this protocol. So if you're treating parvo, you need a veterinarian involved in that and directing that care because they can change on a dime. And there are subtle signs that can kind of help you make prognostic, that can help you with your prognostic indicators to decide who are good outpatient um, cases. So down to my patient selection and animal welfare. I stole this from Rachel Finney out at Capital Area in Ohio. Um, I went to a lecture of hers several years ago on um, decision making in the shelter because I just figured, well, people make decisions. That's what you do, right? And she got up there, she's not a veterinarian, she's an executive director, development um, administrator there. And she's like, yeah, you know what it is? In animal welfare, we always say, well, what's the most important thing in making any decision in our, in our care? Who comes first? Who comes first? The sick. the sick, the animal, right? Every one of us is like, it's the animal, it's all about the puppy, it's about the puppy. But you know that there's gotta be more than that. It's about the animal, but it's also about your organization and your people. What's the emotional commitment? What's the financial commitment? Um, what are all the other elements that play a role? And that doesn't mean that the animal's not important. We are all in this because of the animals. We probably like them better than most people, even some of our family members. <laughs> but you can't become so focused on them that you lose sight of the health of your organization and the health of your staff because you need that organization and staff to continue to do your work. So it's a part, it, any decision, and, and that comes right down to an individual animal care decision needs to involve all these pieces. And so I do think it's important that in looking at Annie, we wanna look and say, what are her prognostic indicators for treatment with what we've got? Maybe we need to treat her in the shelter and our staff is there 12 hours a day. Is she a good patient for that? Is she the right patient? Or do we need to send her to the hospital? Can we afford to send her to a private practice? Because it's not fair to offer her less than the level of care that she needs based on her signs, okay? So what is her degree of illness? Very, very sick parvo cases tend to have low temperatures, low body temperatures. Um, they get third spacing of fluids. So you're giving them sub-Q fluids and it's all just kind of sitting under their skin. And I've heard people say, oh, they must not be dehydrated anymore because it's just kind of sitting there. But what it is is that they're so dehydrated that their perfusion has dropped so low and their protein levels are so low that the fluid doesn't get absorbed. It just sits there. That's actually a poor prognostic indicator, not a good one. Now, again, if they're bouncing all around, maybe you give them too many fluids. But if they're laying there and their fluids are pooling, that's because there's other elements that are making them a poor, putting them in poor condition. Um, the length of time to diagnosis. Did you catch them early when they were bouncing around or did you catch them when they were flat out? That makes a difference in terms of how they're going to, in terms of their survivability. So a lot of illness or a severe illness, it's been a while, they've got a low PCV, low total protein because they're losing protein. They're third spacing their fluids, they've got a low body temperature. These guys may not be the best for some sort of outpatient or compromised protocol. They need the gold standard. But if you've got that bouncing around Annie and you caught her early, you may very well do um, okay with this other protocol. 
You want to make sure that your organization can treat them effectively and obviously the adoptability of the patient in the long run. That doesn't apply to Annie. She's highly adoptable. We all agree? Yeah. She's a beagle. Maybe you're not so prone to that. But yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does not include, include plasma as just the baseline, no. It can be a treatment. Um, those are really for your most severely affected patients. So most of the time people reach for plasma when those animals are, their, their total proteins are dropping, their thirds facing, and that sort of thing. But it doesn't have to be standard necessarily. Yes, ma'am. What about Parvo 1? Like okay, yeah. Now? I was wondering, Lily had asked me about that yesterday, and I double checked which one you were talking about. So Parvo 1, there's an experimental product that is, has been made from goose antibodies that a company is working on in the Dakotas. And I remembered, because I actually work in the Dakotas in the summer, that we were talking about that. It was supposed to be out in the spring. As far as I know, it's not out. So it's been used experimentally that supposedly there's this magic goose antibody. It also works against dengue fever and some other stuff. So the word's still out. I don't know. I don't know if it's as effective as they're saying. Um, but supposedly it's coming down the pike. I'm going to be there next week on a reservation. Maybe I'll try to go knocking on the door and see if the company is still there or if their, their shutters are shut. Um, just want to remind you, you've all seen the five freedoms, I'm sure, but remind you that in choosing these patients and how we're going to treat them, we need to always remember the five freedoms. Um, and Marie, so my five-minute warning, is that to the hour? Okay, so I need to wrap up. I included in your notes, remember, quats do not, your Kenosol, your Parvosol, not effective against Parvo. Even if it's called Parvosol, you need bleach, you need accelerated hydrogen peroxide, you can use trifectant, but not your quats. If you don't know what your cleaner is, it's probably a quat. Look at it, if it says quaternary ammonium, not effective against Parvo. I included this sheet for you. Um, you can get this offline, download it, laminate it, stick it on your wall, make it part of your outbreak plan, okay? So in conclusion, patient side tests, may have a place in your shelter. If you're still confused on how to use them, feel free to contact us, watch the videos. Um, learn how to use them now before you have Parvo in your shelter. Learn to use them now. Because I will tell you, you're not gonna have the patience when you're in the middle of an outbreak. Can you support that idea since you use them? Yeah, learn to use them now. Um, outpatient protocols may be helpful for you. Always remember to select your patients carefully. We want to give them the level of care that they need or it's not a humane level of care. And do think about, this is my little controversial question to throw out there, is there a place for proactive prevention such as subsidized vaccination clinics in your community? If those animals walking into your shelter, the homeless animals, the unaltered animals, are the ones with low antibody titers, they're the ones perpetuating parvo in your community. Is there a place to try and get vaccinations to them if, they, if their owners cannot afford care? I think there is. You know my bias. You heard my intro. Um, but, but think about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maddie's Fund, Janet Swanson, Cornell, ASPCA, the SPCA of Tompkins County that lets us hang out over there and play with puppies and kittens, um, ASB and all of you for showing up today. I really appreciate it. Thank you.